I'm very excited for today's interview. I'd like to introduce Samantha Scott, a very good friend of mine. She currently works as a nurse at St. Mary's in the cardiac telemetry unit. She'll tell us more about that later. Um, she had made a career change from teaching to nursing about seven years ago. Samantha, thank you so much for being here and for everything you've done as a nurse during this time. So welcome to the show. Oh, you are the sweetest. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here talking to you. Yeah. So can you give us kind of an idea, a little introduce yourself and kind of what life's like right now for you? Absolutely. So um, I live in Reno, Nevada. I have a very close knit family. We all live within about 10 minutes of each other with, with the exception of my aunt who lives in California, but she's she visits quite a bit anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, we all kind of help take care of my 99 year old grandma. Wow. And we're uh, just kind of getting through quarantine land like everyone else right now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what a crazy year it has been. I know. I um, still can't believe it. <laughs> and we're living it. it. Um, and as you know, this is also partway through my second year of nursing. So the first year of nursing was a doozy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so kind of um, with regard to how I got there, I did, as you mentioned, start out as a teacher. I was teaching elementary music and art. Definitely got to the point where there was kind of the burnout spiral and mm -hmm. it was definitely becoming something that I was doing for reasons that were not necessarily mine. So it was time for a change. After that decision was made, it just happened. I had been looking at just random things that sounded like they could be a cool thing to do while I was looking at next steps. And mm -hmm. I was offered a job at a, as a patient safety advocate at the hospital where I'm working now. Oh, patient wow. safety yeah, patient safety advocates um, help the nurses monitor the floor. They help, um, they can sometimes sit in rooms with patients that maybe need an extra eye on them if they have dementia or some other, uh, you know, some other impairment of their, of their level of consciousness. Helping people that, you know, helping people up so that they don't fall, that kind of thing. So. I started getting a look at nursing firsthand about a month after I started that I unfortunately had two family members go into the hospital. Oh no. So I got the family side of exactly what a nurse can do for your family member for you. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the family members that was hospitalized was my grandmother. And there was a nurse who I'm still friends with today that was just the kindest person in the world to her and was such a comfort to my family at that time. Um, so one morning I was there at work, walking up and down the hallway, checking on rooms, making uh -huh. sure everyone was okay. And it was just kind of one of those, okay, so let's do this. Let's. <laughs> yeah. Like an aha moment. Like, yeah. I kind of like this. Wow. <laughs> that is so cool. I didn't realize the impact um, a nurse actually had in your life and that kind of led you down the road to nursing. That is really cool. <laughs> So um, when you decided like, hey, I think this is something I want to do, what was the next step you took to kind of get you going in the direction of becoming a nurse? Um, so the first thing that happened was they were offering the PSAs at our facility the opportunity to become CNAs, which are certified nursing assistants. So you're allowed to help with nursing tasks, but it's it's not clinical nursing tasks, it's comfort measures, it's helping get people cleaned up, helping get people mobilized and walking, helping make sure that everyone is eating, drinking, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. Um, helping answer call lights. Right, very um, important stuff. Absolutely, so yeah. that was the next step. And 
I, it was actually kind of bizarre. I had applied to nursing schools and I had heard all of the horror stories about, oh, it took me two years to get in. Oh, it took me five tries to get in. You know, I'll, I, I heard a ton of stories uh -huh. and one day I got, I took the entrance test mm -hmm. and I got a call saying we have a cohort starting in two weeks. <laughs> what? Are you ready? <laughs> wow. And I kind of had to take a second because it was like, I was not expecting this to happen for, <laughs> for, for a couple a of years <laughs> or at least a few months. Whoa. So you got was, accepted and you, two weeks later, you started classes? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I went to a, a private college here, in, a private college here in town that focuses on healthcare sciences in particular. So they have programs for medical assisting. They have programs for phlebotomy. Um, I know at some of their locations, they have like dental hygienist programs and um, all of that kind of things. And the best thing about that was it wasn't a, once you were in, you were in, it wasn't a, you have to take all of the prerequisites and then apply for the nursing program. Did you have to choose a specific area of expertise or did you just do general studies? How does that work? So when you get a registered nursing degree, the baseline is in, um, is in associates. So okay you don't have to specialize at that level. Um, a lot of specialty skills and specialty knowledge are accrued either in further education or once you get onto the floor. Okay. For instance, when I started on the cardiac telemetry unit where I work, which is a unit where patients are there because they need to be on a heart monitor. Mm-hmm so that we can be watching their heart rhythm, their heart function. On our unit, they're generally there for cardiac reasons. Okay. There's also a unit at our hospital where you have to be on a heart monitor for some reason, but you're not necessarily there because of a heart problem. Okay. Okay. Um, it could be because they're having to aggressively treat you for an infection and they want to make sure that they're not, you know, they're not causing anything too crazy to happen. Um, mm. Just kind of sick for other reasons, but they want to keep an eye on your heart as well. How did you make it into the cardiac telemetry unit? Is that something you chose or is it what was available? Yeah. Um, it was, so when you filled out the application um, to be a registered nurse at the facility, they gave you the opportunity to enroll in what's called um, the TTP, Transition to Practice Program. Okay. And as part of that application, you were able to put like your first three. Oh, okay. I would like to work here, here, and here. Um, telemetry was one of those options for me. The benefit to have um, been a CNA in the same facility beforehand um, the certified nursing assistants at this point were float pools. So we got sent all over the place. Oh, okay. So it was a wonderful opportunity to see all of the units and their different personalities and how the staffs worked together and the types of patients that they saw there. So it was definitely a team that I felt I could learn a lot from. Mm -hmm. It was an area that was very interesting. Um, my grandpa, when I was 15 years old, um, passed away from a heart attack. So it was interesting to me to find out more about the cardiac world in general. Right, right. And look at those patients in particular. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, just kind of the experience that you had working at St. Mary's before kind of gave you an idea of where you wanted to go and end up. And it's really cool that you're there right now. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. How, how many years did it take for you to um, go through nursing school to become a registered nurse? So my registered nursing program was two years. Okay. And then the school that I went to works closely with another school that has a 
online program that lets you finish up um, to the bachelor's level. Oh, okay. So, so during my oh, first year of nursing, I was also continuing to take classes online to finish up that BSN. Okay, so you do have a BSN, a bachelor's in science? In three weeks. Oh, in three weeks. Oh, that's really exciting. I'm on my last class in three weeks, it's done. Oh, congrats. So you've been working and doing online school as well. Yes. So that's, so that's been about an additional, um, 19 months. Wow. That's amazing, that's Samantha. Good. Good. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. That's so awesome. <laughs> Do you have a, another bachelor's degree? My, <laughs> I am one of those people that had infinite amounts of trouble deciding what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> so my initial bachelor's degree is a bachelor of arts in psychology. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. From UNR. Okay. That's great. Um, did you, I guess after you got that degree, what work did you pursue? So I got that degree and it didn't take me long to realize that I may very well need therapy myself if I pursued that path <laughs> professionally. So I rolled straight into a master's program for elementary education. Oh, okay. And did you get that at UNR as well? That was through University of Phoenix. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. They still had an underground campus here in Reno at that point. Okay. And is that what led you to teaching? Yep. And then I entered into the teaching world. Um, I felt like it was time to do something <laughs> and, and make a decision. So. Right. It is nice to make money after going to school for so long. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> make that transition from paying someone to getting paid. It, it makes a difference. <laughs> But I'm a lot like you. I think um, going into my undergrad, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do and, you know, did one one degree and then moved to a master's and then, you know, got my... Absolutely. I've been very proud to watch your journey as well. You've done oh. so many interesting things. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's great to be able to share um, our stories with each other and you, you've really inspired me. I'm so happy to to even witness the journey because it's it's been the last i guess seven years and um i remember as you were studying and you know get taking those tests and um you just you guys were quizzing me at trivia night with my flashcards. <laughs> yeah exactly like helping you out and um yeah so it's so great to see you now doing something it sounds like you still you love it and it sounds like a really good fit for you yeah, it is. It is a good fit. It's definitely a challenging job. Yes. Yeah. And I have to say, I feel like we're both lucky to have the group of friends that we have that are so supportive and constantly sending funny pictures on the group text to help pick up the day. Right. Keeping things light for sure. The job of a nurse is hard in I'll say normal times, how have you been doing during these difficult times in the pandemic? I know you guys, like I said, are on the front lines, have been working nonstop. So um, I guess what's it's that been, been like for you? It's been, def well, there have been several interesting things. The unit that I work in is sandwiched in between the medical telemetry unit that I was talking about mm -hmm. and critical care. Oh, okay. Those are the two units that primarily staff our COVID units. Wow. So the nurses from our unit can float to either of those places. Oh, okay. So you floated to both? Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, so the uh, initially, uh, it just started out as we were having to take a bit more of a patient load because nurses were having to float for a shift to other units in mm -hmm. order to help help with COVID and help with that patient influx. Mm -hmm. It was definitely one of those situations where you would walk out of a shift and see someone not wearing a mask and want to walk straight up to them and say, 
you need to fix this now. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine. <laughs> right now, go put on the mask, wash your hands. I want to see all of this. <laughs> right. Please. Oh my gosh. And this was especially true at the beginning when we were still learning mm -hmm. about the disease itself and we're still getting an idea of how bad this was going to be. Mm-hmm how contagious this was going to be, the impact that it was going to have. Most of us at that point had, were not that long on our own. When you start nursing, you have three months of what we call preceptorship. Okay. So you have another nurse that is with you that is, you know, helping you look over the paperwork and, ma and paperwork and massing, uh, master the charting is helping you um, kind of put the dots together with regard to, okay, so school taught you this, and now it's time to put it into real world practice. So mm -hmm. we're taking a look at, okay, this is the patient, this is the problem, here's what we're doing about it, and mm -hmm. here's why. <laughs> right. Wow. So most of us had come off of our preceptorships the week of Thanksgiving. Wow. We were about two, two and a half months on our own when all of this. Oh my gosh. I cannot even imagine that. In. Wow. So it was, it was definitely kind of a culture shock. I feel like we had a good team of nurses that were really good at helping lift each other up and being resources for each other right. as well. Um, we also noticed that the people, and this is this is still truer, um, truer than it was. Uh, the people that are staying in the hospital now are sicker than they were. Oh, and this is not just with COVID. The idea with the physicians and with the facility in particular have been, if obviously with the situation that we're in. If the people don't need to be here, mm -hmm. then we should have them be here. <laughs> right, right. We should, you know, we should use whatever alternate resources we have in order to get them the care they need, but they don't necessarily need to be admitted to the hospital. So the people right. that we saw on the floor were really legitimately sick. <laughs> oh, wow. And on our floor, it, sometimes we would get patients that had had a minor procedure in the cath lab that we would just kind of be observing overnight. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to see some of those again, but for a good long while there, the entire unit was pretty darn sick. Oh no. It was, so we had to do a lot of learning very quickly. Yeah, no, definitely. That was real fast trial by fire. Yeah. We also wow. started getting sent to, Generally, the policy is that you start floating after a year. So okay. they give you a year to get your feet under you mm -hmm. um, before they start sending you to other units, all of that. With the situation that we were in, it was kind of all hands on deck. We started floating at six months. Wow. So that was another element to the learning process. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I was impressed just knowing that you were a nurse in this time, but hearing how quickly you kind of had to to adjust um, is amazing. Like, I'm not surprised. Uh, you're, oh. you're very, very smart and um, they're really lucky to have you, but I, I can't believe the, the, I didn't realize that you had to go through that. Um, on top of the just experiencing um, just COVID as a nurse, um, I guess you mentioned that your coworkers have been really supportive. Is that, has that continued or have you noticed some burnout or how's that going? Um, there's a lot of tired right now. Mm -hmm. Um, we definitely have continued the teamwork, have continued to be very supportive of each other, but there's, there's a lot of tired people yeah. are still kind of recovering from the worst of this. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, we spent about two and a half months on what we call team nursing. So instead of our normal 
one nurse to four or five patients that we would be seeing, it was a primary nurse and a secondary nurse to up to 10 patients. Okay. And so each, each of those nurses would have a different set of responsibilities and it was exhausting. I remember looking down at the step tracker on my watch one day and just kind of shaking my head being like, I can't. Oh my gosh. How many steps? How many steps are on there right now? Wow. Do you remember how many? I want to say that it was almost 16,000. It was, and, and I hadn't left the unit all day. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so crazy. And so how long are your shifts? Is, is, is it the normal shifts that you have or have you guys had to take longer shifts or what's your so schedule our, like? So our shifts are 12. So we have a 12 hour shifts three days a week. And okay. then there's an extra four hours that we can use to do continuing education that we can use to um, come in and do, there are um, computer modules that we have to do called health streams with regard to um, either policy changes that are coming up or we, it's actually interesting. They've come up with a computerized system for us to be able to do our CPR credentials Oh, wow. Yeah, part of it is the part of the computerized system hooks up to the dummy that you can do the compressions on and oh. it kind of it kind of tells you push deeper, go faster. No, <laughs> no way. So did that come out because of COVID? They're trying to have an up or have they, they had, had that? Actually, they had actually rolled that out about a year and a half before. Oh, OK. OK. Um, what research has shown is that CPR skills deteriorate after three months. So we have one of these segments to do every three months. Oh, okay. That's good to know. I'm glad that you guys stay up yeah. to date on that. <laughs> what are some suggestions as a nurse uh, that you can give the general public that would be helpful um, to you guys the biggest thing that really can't be overstated is to listen to the science, mm -hmm. listen to the guidelines. We do know that masks work, hand washing works, keeping to kind of your own little bubble mm -hmm. is incredibly helpful. And I also think that it's important that people not see the vaccine as a get out of jail free card because we're not quite out of this yet. Mm -hmm. um, there are still a lot of people that need the vaccine. There are still a lot of people that need the second dose of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that, like I said, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Mm -hmm. And that a vaccine is important and it's one of the fastest tracks that we have out of this thing, but it is not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I think that's great advice. I think it's so easy to take the hope that the vaccine uh, brings and turn it into a miracle, right? Like it's not going to happen overnight. We're, we're still working towards getting people vaccinated. Um, you've been vaccinated, correct, for your job or where are you yes. on that? Yes, um, they set up a they set up the hospital vaccine clinic in one of the education rooms in the building, and <laughs> the the education ladies have been um, really stepping up their game. Uh, we have a lot of staff members that now have um, both vaccines. Some are still um, going to get their second dose, but they they've done a good job about trying to make sure that we're all as protected as we can be. That's great. That's so great to hear. And um, it just, it sounds like we're moving forward, but I think it's a good reminder that I like the way you said it. It's not a get out of free jail card. So, or no, get out of jail free card. And it's, it's hard because it is so exciting. Mm -hmm. And this is like the ray of hope after the year that we've all had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What are some 
things that you've done, you know, outside of work to kind of take care of yourself, to relax, to enjoy life? Um, what are some of your hobbies? Absolutely. Um, so I've continued my guitar lessons. I've been learning electric and acoustic guitar. Awesome. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a blast. Yeah. Um, you can do a lot of interesting thing with a lot of interesting things with the electric guitar amp. It's oh, I you bet. Can do all sorts of cool stuff. Knitting was a hobby that I had that kind of fell by the wayside for a while. That mm -hmm. has come back. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I've just been doing simple things, hats and scarves, and I love taking walks. Mm -hmm. And we're lucky enough to live in a place that gets 300 plus days of sunshine a year. There's lots of opportunities to put on a good podcast and mm -hmm. go and walk around and enjoy nature. Yeah. I'm also a total story addict. So we have an embarrassing amount of streaming services in the house right now. <laughs> I've been listening to a ton of audiobooks. I've been doing a ton of reading. Awesome. And yeah, so it's just been kind of that lay low, simple pleasure kind of things. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So with the guitar, have you been, because you're a, an amazing singer. I know that for <laughs> sure. So have you been able to continue with that, that hobby? Singing along with the radio for sure. As we know, there there have not been a lot of public options for singing as of late. Right, right. And um, as I mentioned, I, I do have quite a few high-risk family members. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't wanted to accrue any extra risk that way. Right. It sounds difficult if you're working at a hospital to kind of uh, minimize the exposures. Are you just on your off time? You just try to um, stay in and kind of in your bubble. You kind of mentioned is that exactly yeah. Um. So. Um. I definitely have what what I call my sanitation station on the way into the house. Oh yeah, good. <laughs> So on my way into the house, I have um, my robe that I change into. All of my work clothes immediately go into a hamper. I have wipes that I can use to wipe off my phone, my watch, mm -hmm. my keys, anything else that I had with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Definitely wearing a mask if I'm not around anyone that I don't directly live with. Mm -hmm. Um. One of one of the kind of hilarious things at this point, um, at the beginning of this, as I've said, it got really scary. And a big important tradition in my family is Sunday dinner. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking on the phone with my mom and my aunt one day, and I was like, "I, I don't know what to do. I don't know that I can come. I don't want to put anyone at risk." Um, right. This, you know, my aunt talked to my grandma about it and called me back about 10 minutes later saying that grandma was incredibly upset. So oh. we had to figure out something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so she has a dining room table that extends out to 22 feet. So we have it all the way extended. Wow. And she sits over at one end and I sit over at the other end and I have one space in the living room where I sit that is more than six weeks away or more than six feet away from her. Mm -hmm. And I have my mask on if I'm um, not actively eating or drinking. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you're making it work, you know, the best you can. So, but it's been hard. It's been really hard. So. Yeah. And I know that no one, you know, goes out at the beginning of the day being like, okay, let's see what I can expose my family to. You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but it's one of the, um, one of the insidious things about all of this is that there really are no easy decisions. It's right. okay. Do I take this risk or do I take this risk? Right. You know, and um, one of the things that I found helpful too is, I think it was the CDC um, had a graphic at one point mm -hmm. that kind of associated different activities with kind of a risk level. Mm -hmm. 
a con an unmasked concert or sporting event with like yelling and screaming and talking and eating was like a 10. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And taking a walk outside was like a two. <laughs> oh, okay. That's really helpful. I'll have to look that up. Um, so I, I've been kind of using that and trying to stick as much as I possibly can to the activities on the lower end of that, of that risk scale. Yeah. Well, you bring up such a good point because it's, we're constantly making a decision, right, about our health and well-being, our risk factors, you know, what we're going to expose ourselves and then potentially our family members to. And I've noticed, um, and people have even called it kind of like COVID fatigue and you bringing that up, like we're constantly trying to make these decisions about what's right, what's wrong. And I think people are tired. It, do it doesn't mean that, you know, just give up, but it, it kind of explains right. where people's state of mind is, is because we are constantly making these decisions that, I don't know, probably half the time I make the wrong, the wrong one, but you know, it's, it, we're doing the best we can. So, um, Absolutely. yeah. Um, well, and my friends that are parents right now, I just have all the respect in the world because those are some of the hardest decisions that I've had to witness mm -hmm. are with regard to, you know, the, do I go to work? Do I stay home? Do I send them to school? Do I not? Right. You know, if I if I make the choice not to, how do we manage that as a family? Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Because it's not only making the decision for yourself, it's making the decision for however many people are in the family. And I can't imagine. I agree with you. I, I have mad respect for all the parents out there right now. And um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're at like... <laughs> You know, everyone's been affected in one way or another and some more than others, but you know, it's these decisions and they're hard, but um, I guess we just take it one day at a time. And, yeah. Well, yeah. and COVID fatigue is very real. And I think the reality of the situation is that this is likely something that we're going to have to learn to live with as opposed to something that's just going to magically disappear somehow. Right. I think that we're going to need to find ways to get back to a point where we're enjoying life and we're taking good care of our mental health and we're establishing meaningful human connection while also, as you've said, mitigating the risk to ourselves and others, kind of doing what's best for the community as a whole. Right, right, exactly. have any other kind of advice for others to maybe how they can keep connections or maintain their mental health because I think unfortunately a lot of people have been really struggling. There is an absolutely incredible amount of research being done on mental health right now in particular since human beings aren't intended to be at home by themselves and talk to each other through screens. Mm -hmm. that, that's not what we're hardwired to do. Right. That being said, <laughs> you, you use the tools you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if screens are, or if screens are what's available, definitely do use them. Phones are, you know, phones, FaceTime, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, I also saw a really cool um, report the other day on groups of friends that were making kind of weird little traditions. Like there were, there were, it, and of course this was two guys, but mm -hmm. their thing was that they would go for a walk outside. They would have a specific time one day every week. They would meet halfway between their two houses, give each other a high five. And <laughs> go the other way, <laughs> you know, and go the other way. And it was, you know, their way of making sure that they saw each other and have that connection. Both of them talked about how it was something that they like looked forward to all week. Oh, yeah. That's so so cool. coming up with little things, um, I've heard of people doing um, nights where they're either on the phone or 
you know, or they do have their family member on Zoom and they're, they all have like a recipe that they're making dinner from and a movie that they've all agreed to watch on Netflix or, you know. Oh, cool. Or whatever. So you might not be able to um, be with them, but you can have that kind of connection. Yeah. The other important thing um, is finding ways to process Mm -hmm. because as you've said we've 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 all been through a lot these Mm -hmm. last few months so whether it's knitting whether it's journaling whether it's art Mm -hmm. um poetry whatever it is that helps you to process your particular situation and kind of how you've been affected by all of this Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some great advice. I, I think it's so important. Um, yeah, to just be able to process and, um, I think a lot of creativity has come out of this. I mean, obviously this has been, there's been a lot of tragedy throughout, but, um, you know, there's definitely some positive springing up and, um, I think those are some great ideas that you shared and I hope, uh, I hope people take that to heart and, figure out their own things too. So that's really cool. Absolutely. Um, One of my favorite things have been all of the artists that have been doing online recording sessions from Mm. their living rooms or mini concerts from their front porch or- (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That is so cool. You're right. Um, But yeah, with, with regard to connectivity and processing, you also have to like I said, keep the risk factors in mind. And we we all want to come out of this alive in as many ways as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there are deal breakers, finding a way to do something safely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like, for instance, with my family, Sunday dinner kind of turned into a deal breaker. Mm-hmm. And so taking a look at you know, I know a lot for a lot of people like church is a deal breaker. So taking a look at how to do those things and do them safely. Mm -hmm. Hey friends, I'm not too sure what happened in this next segment, but my face is frozen. Don't let that distract you from what Sam is living forward to. Thanks for watching and enjoy. Sam, I was wondering if you could share with us um, what you're living forward to. Um, Well, as I mentioned earlier, I am definitely looking forward to being done with my BSN in three weeks. That's going to be very cool. Very exciting. Over the past like six years of my life, there has been just a lot of action, a lot of go, 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 go. And this is happening. And then this is happening. And Mm -hmm. then this is happening. Um, Right now, I'm kind of coming into a phase of life where I'm kind of letting the dust settle. Mm -hmm. So my big focus right now, and I've been kind of trying to sneakily do this over the past few weeks as well is um, taking a serious look at balance, Mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, kind of letting um, fun activities creep back in more and more, making sure that there is, that balance between the life, you know, life and the challenges of work with school and work. It was, there was, there was a lot of focus on nursing land in general. Right. Right. (laughs) And I, I love nursing land, but I, I also know that there is a whole world that also has a whole bunch of opportunities to do some pretty amazing things. Yes, absolutely. Um, Yep. So take, um, making sure that I'm, having the things that I enjoy creep back in. I've been taking a look at completely unrelated volunteer activities around town. Um, All of that kind of stuff, just making sure that I'll, you know, that I'm kind of getting back to living life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I also um, got accepted to our facility has a telemetry fellowship. So congrats. um, I'll be doing that. It's um, 
some extra learning and reinforcement and you come out of it with your PCCN, um, mm -hmm. progressive, um, clinical care nursing, uh, credential. Oh, wow. How long is that so, fellowship? Um, that is going to be over in November. Okay. So it's about eight, nine months. Wow. Congratulations. That's so exciting. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. We, um, so just right now, just taking the time to hone the craft, mm -hmm. um, kind of be able to do the job without trying to also do school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I felt too like it would be kind of a good transition. As as you know, I've been in school for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I figured it would be a good kind of transition activity. It sounds like there will be a lot of things that will be immediately applicable to the work environment that we're in. Oh, awesome. That's so great. If you can now tell us what you love about yourself now that'd be great absolutely and i definitely am one of those people for whom this is i, I had to give some thought to this question <laughs> <laughs> there was um i'm definitely one of those people that has a hard time answering this one mm -hmm. um i have to say that what i'm proudest of the most is the resilience that i've that I've seen in the past year from myself and from those around me in general, just mm -hmm. so I, um, I stepped into a career that was pretty outside of my wheelhouse. Um, anyone who's known me for as long as you have knows that I was liberal arts girl for most of my life. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is not that. <laughs> <laughs> no. And it was a difficult set of circumstances. So the fact that I have shown resilience and made it through and um, have continued to get up and get up again is one thing that I really do love about where I'm at right now in life. Yeah, that's awesome. And Sam, you're very inspirational. Um, you're so smart and very hardworking and the fact that you were able to go from liberal, liberal arts girl to a nurse is, it's just a great testament of, you know, when you put your mind to something and you try hard and you work hard, uh, you know, you can make it. So you're definitely an inspiration to me and I really value the, the impact you've had on my life. So, and I can't thank you enough for um, to all that you've been doing, especially in this time, it's not easy to get thrown into a pandemic after, like you said, two and a half months of <laughs> nursing on your own. Um, you've been doing a great job and we're so lucky to have you as a community. So I just have to thank you and I can't thank you enough. As you know, we actually work together um, uh, in youth ministry and we used to play a lot of games. So I was hoping you'd be interested in playing a couple games. Are you interested? Absolutely. Let's awesome. do it. Okay. So two truths and a lie. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go sure. first? Okay, great. Um, number one is my first pet ever was a hedgehog. Mm. Number two is... I have had to sing opera while wearing blue paint and Christmas lights as part of my costume. Mm. Number three is I was the first inspector general in my ROTC battalion in high school because I made some comments on a paper that the instructors took to heart. <laughs> hmm. Well, that's difficult. I know you were in, I feel like I know you were in ROTC, but, uh, but I could also see you being the first inspector general, <laughs> um, singing while wearing, you said blue paint and blue face paint, blue face paint. Okay. And then your first pet was a hedgehog. I'm going to guess that the lie is your first pet was a hedgehog. 
<laughs> yeah. Yay! <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. That would have been an, an awesome first pet. <laughs> oh, it would have been. Yeah, definitely. We had, we had a dog. <laughs> oh, well, third grade too. What, um, Absolutely. where, I guess what, tell me more about singing with uh, opera and blue face paint. Uh -huh. So I was a member of the Nevada Opera Chorus in high school and the Nevada Opera was putting on a production of Mozart's The Magic Flute. Okay. And they tapped three of us from the opera from the youth opera chorus to be the to be the spirits. Oh, okay. So we were literally wearing so we had like these um we had like these gauzy robes that we were wearing with vests with Christmas lights under them and blue face paint. And we were up literally up in a cherry picker because we were supposed to be like the spirits that were offering advice from above. And <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so cool. It was easily the strangest situation ever. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. But also a great story. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, Okay, so you were an inspector general. Had that not been a position before? Not not in the battalion that I was a part of. Okay, okay. Wow, that's great. You're just blazing your own trail. I love it. You're like, <laughs> I love it. That's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was actually kind of funny. <laughs> um, okay, well, I have a couple for you. Okay. So the first one is... I worked in DC for a month and attended legislative hearings one summer in my during my undergrad. I lived in Florence, Italy for a semester while studying abroad, or I went to Mexico with my tournament softball team and helped put on a softball camp. So I can definitely picture you helping to put on a softball camp. <laughs> Um, I know that that's been a big part of your life, softball and sports in general. Um, I know you lived, I know that you were in Italy for study abroad. I want to say though that it wasn't Florence, but it could be. <laughs> um, and I. I remember law school. I'm not sure that I remember hearing about you going to DC. So which one do you think it is? Ah, I have to be careful not to give you a tell. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say, because I know that you did absolutely fantastically in law school, I can definitely see you getting the opportunity to go back and observe legislative hearings. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, ah, uh, jeez. I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to go with, I, I, I don't think it was Florence that you lived in in Italy. You're right. That's <laughs> a lie. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I remember it being like Torino or somewhere around there. Yeah, it's uh, it was Viterbo, but the study abroad yeah. program I went through, they had a, um, so they had Viterbo and Torino, so I chose Viterbo. So good job. Good memory. Yeah, I spent, <laughs> um, when I was an undergrad, so my aunt actually, she lived and worked in D.C., and so I think my sophomore year of college, I went... Uh, she had she knew somebody who was a lobbyist and I got to intern for him for like a month so yeah I got to go down there or oh, that's amazing yeah it was really cool I always I kind of forget about that um but it was such an amazing experience and um and yeah I did do a softball camp my senior year of high school in Mexico <laughs> which was so fun <laughs> so good job you know me so well <laughs> um so I have another game called rapid fire Okay. Um, oh, and you got me this cup. Go get him, tiger. So, <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm I have. Gl I'm glad it's there. Yeah, I love it. Um, so <laughs> I, yeah, I'll 
ask you questions first and see how many you um, can get in a minute. Just don't let C. Ross use it. He will turn it into a tiger. Yeah, just don't let Ross let you see, yeah, see you use it. He'll turn it into a Tiger King thing. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh oh, it might be too late if he watches this. <laughs> All right, let me get the timer. All right, you ready? Absolutely. All right. So, what's your dream job? So my dream job right now, um, I got to spend some time um, during nursing school in the OR and I found that super interesting. So um, being an OR nurse or learning um, or getting continuing education to be what they call a first assist would Ooh. be super fun. Um, just my completely out there dream job would be um, one of those people on TV that gets to like go around to all of the different places of the world and eat the food and yeah. talk about all of the stuff that they see. Oh, I love that. Uh, I think that would be so much fun. That would be so awesome. I'm totally with you. Um, do you call it soda or pop? Soda. <laughs> what are some study tips for nursing students? So, oh, go oh ahead no. and answer. <laughs> um, can can I go ahead and answer? Yeah, anyway? definitely. Biggest study tips for nursing students is, um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. It is to know that this is learning that is going to continue throughout your life so you don't need to know every little detail right now so I would focus on the big picture and how things connect awesome that's some great um, advice as, yeah as opposed to trying to memorize every single little detail about um what some tiny little bone in your ear does. Mm. So the, so um, for nursing students, I would say focus on the big concepts and how they kind of all fit together. And you can you can over time hone in on the small little detail-y things. That's awesome advice. Um, <laughs> awesome. Do you have some questions for me? I do. Awesome. Um, all right. So. I'll set the time. I know, I know that you're a Peloton girl. So who is your favorite Peloton instructor? Oh, that is such a hard question. Um, oh, so I'm going to, I'm going to say Robin Arzon because she, she's inspired me to kind of go outside of my comfort zone and she used to be an attorney. So I'm okay. super inspired by her and I love her classes. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I, I have not, I don't have a ton of experience with Peloton, but I'm, I'm getting more intrigued by the day. <laughs> Let me know um, if you have any questions. Is, absolutely. What is a random skill you would love to have? Mm, I would love to, oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd love to be able to speak French. I guess that's a skill. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And what is oh, wow. how about Aunt ask it? I wanna I wanna see what the next one is. <laughs> what is your favorite guilty pleasure TV show or book or um so my favorite guilty pleasure TV show is Criminal Mind. <laughs> it's so it's funny though because as like I've been more involved in in law and since I work in criminal uh, law it's been a little bit less I don't know I don't watch it as much and the season's already finished but I don't know I just always I was like uh, felt so connected to the team I'm kind of like yeah that's yeah. you know I don't know but that's my little guilty pleasure so. And that is one of so we we watch a lot of those kinds of shows as a family like we like NCIS and all yeah. of that you know all of that stuff Crim and, well, and criminal minds on paper since I you know since I do love psychology and all of that should be like 
something that I absolutely love. It freaks me out. It is so creepy. Like I cannot watch it at home alone at night. Like it's just not, you know, it's something, yeah, I have to watch with someone else or. Um, and I, think, I think that's part of the issue was the first time I watched it. It was, I was just looking for something random to watch. I was home alone. It mm -hmm. wound up being a home invasion episode. Oh no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing your story with us and just uh, show it. Sorry, sharing yourself. Thank you so much, Lorena. I am interested to see the rest of your episodes of this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I hope you enjoy them. Um, this is such a cool endeavor that you're taking on. I thank I you. Like it. Thanks. That's awesome. What well, I really appreciate the support.